In November of 2022, I put out a video basically asking the question, would 2023 be a good year to buy a house? It ended up being my most popular video of that year and also, I guess, the most controversial because I had the most negative comments by far on that video with a lot of people calling me crazy. Now, I did title the video, Am I Crazy? So I guess I kind of set myself up for that. But now we're sitting in the middle of 2023 in June, and I thought it'd be a good idea to go back and look at my projections to see if they're still holding up, how close I was, or if to quote Mr. Kangzar88, I was wrong, wrong, wrong. I also want to give my projections for the end of the year and ultimately answer the question, is 2023 still a good time to purchase a house? And totally yes. What's up everyone, it's Jeff with Jeff West Properties, your host for the Conroe Living Channel, where we identify and celebrate everything that makes Conroe, Texas one of the fastest growing cities in America. In 2022, I made several predictions about the housing market and what it would look like in 2023. So I wanted to go back and look at each of those predictions to see if the data I was seeing held up. The first thing I predicted was that there would be no major price swings on houses in 2023. I believe I said we would either plateau the market or we would lose somewhere in the 1% to 2% value. The housing market is going to lose 1% to 2% of its value. So let's look at what the data shows us in the middle of 2023. Looking at the data, according to CoreLogic, it shows that we've had a 2% gain in home prices year over year in April nationally. While Forbes, quoting the National Association of Realtors, shows a 1.7% decrease in median home price for existing homes year over year. And according to Trading Economics, homes with government-backed loans through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, usually the lower-priced homes, gained 3.6% year over year. So the data is showing us that what we've seen so far, there hasn't been any major swing either direction. It's been somewhat negligible. Now that's pretty stark contrast to at Rick Dynasty's prediction that we would lose 15 to 30 percent. Missed it by that much. My next prediction was that inventory was going to remain low. Inventory is going to continue to stay low. And as far as supply and demand goes, as long as there's not a lot of supply, you're not going to have a big dip in the values of existing homes. There were some that argued that because the forbearance programs of 20 to 21 that bailed a lot of people out were no longer around, that those people were now no longer going to be able to afford their mortgages, and it was going to lead to a flood of foreclosures hitting the market. And if you look at this chart, you'll see there has been a consistent uptick in foreclosures nationally since 2020. Now, a rise in foreclosures going on the market was one of the main things that led to the Great Recession of 2008. So where we sit today, how close is it to those levels that led to the Great Recession? Not even close, but... Uh, yeah, we still got a ways to go. In fact, if you look at the chart, we're still far below most years' foreclosure rates when properties were continuing to appreciate. According to Lawrence Yoon, the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, distressed and forced property sales are virtually non-existent. Other people argued that with the buyer's pool dried up because of affordability issues, that when people put their houses on the market, there wouldn't be anybody to buy them, and ultimately they would have to slash their prices in order to sell. When a housing market is considered balanced, meaning it doesn't favor buyer or seller, that's usually when you have about six months of inventory, meaning it would take six months to sell off all the existing homes on the market. Today, there's 2.9 months worth of inventory, which is up from this time last year where we only had 2.2 months of supply but it's still significantly under the six months it would take to be considered a balanced market. So even though it's not as skewed in the seller's favor as it was during the 2021 housing craze, sellers still have the upper hand. Which I used to my advantage when advantageous. Another prediction I made was that home builders were going to be in a little bit of trouble, but they would ultimately be the thing that would keep the housing market moving. So what happens with all the inventory that the builders are now holding? They're not in the business of holding property, so they've got to sell them. And they may not like me saying this, but it is just a reality. Builders are getting desperate. I just pointed out that currently we have about 2.9 months worth of supply on the resale market. But at the end of last year, new construction homes were responsible for about 8.3 months worth of supply, way skewed to the buyer's advantage. you got to take full advantage. My main takeaway from last year's video was that it was a great time to buy new construction homes because 
builders are not in the habit of holding on to property like an existing homeowner would. If their house doesn't sell, they just keep it and continue to live there. But new home builders sell homes. So they were giving amazing incentives that we had never seen before to be able to move properties. At the end of last year, builder confidence was at its lowest point since May of 2020 when COVID hit. I lack confidence. So what builders did is they gave thousands and thousands of dollars away in incentives to buyers. They bought down the interest rates to keep it more affordable. And ultimately, they ended up slashing their prices just to get people in the door. And it worked. I'm giving you the advantage. Enjoy. In fact, this year, almost every buyer that I've worked with has chosen to go the new construction route. Another prediction I made that was a little bit closer to home is that Texas would continue to sell, continue to appreciate, and continue to be a sound place to invest. But for a market like Conroe, Texas, that pretty much looks to fall right in line with where Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac see it going. So how are we looking this year? Looking at the numbers, Texas in general has appreciated 5.07 year over year since June. Now, I was a little surprised by this, but Conroe, my city, the fastest growing city in America, was actually down 1.4% in prices year over year. However, when I looked even more local, I saw that some of the areas that I've been highlighting recently have had some pretty strong price increases, with Artavia being up 0.6%, Grand Central Park and Watercrest being up 3.3%, Wood Forest being up 7.7%, the Woodlands Hills being up 126 and Harper's Preserve gaining 14.4% this year. Now, not all of my predictions were positive, and on this last one, I didn't quite nail it. I did say that nationally the housing market was going to be stable, but ultimately real estate is local, and there were going to be some areas that were going to see a downturn and lose value. Some markets are more volatile than others. I'm looking at you, Boise, Idaho, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and unfortunately, Austin, Texas they're more in danger of correction, and we're already starting to see that in those markets. So how did that prediction turn out? Though the prediction was correct on those cities being in a little bit of trouble, I didn't see the full weight of other factors that were going to affect not only those areas, but really the regions around them as well. If you look at this chart, you can see how the western cities saw declines while eastern cities saw increases. In fact, you can almost split the nation down the middle and you'll see declines in the west and increases in the east. Oh, it's like night and day! Of the 37 major markets that are east of Colorado, every one of those markets have seen price increases, with the exception of Austin, Texas. I'll talk about that a little more later. Meanwhile, the 12 major housing markets west of Texas all saw price declines. Also, most of the western states as a whole, in general, saw losses, with Nevada leading the way at 4.8% decline, followed by Arizona at 4.2%, California at 3.7%, Utah at 3.1%, Idaho at 2.5%, Colorado at 1.7%, Oregon at 1.6%, and Washington at 1.5%. So why was the market skewed so much on region? Well, there are three major factors to look at. First was COVID migration, and this is what I really considered when I was looking at these markets. When COVID hit, people were forced to work from home, and some companies realized that they didn't see any drop-off in production, so they retooled some things to make work at home more permanent. So when people realized they could work from anywhere, a lot of people just picked up and went to more desirable areas than where they were living. I might go west. And if you look at the western states, you've got the mountains, you've got the Pacific Ocean, all areas that we would consider to be more desirable. Unfortunately, a lot of those businesses ultimately decided that this was not a good plan and they brought their employees back into the workplace. And what this meant was the people who had moved away from the city where their businesses were had to either move back home or they had to look for new work. And a lot of these Western states did not have the infrastructure to provide those jobs. I might as well pack up and go home. So a lot of those same people migrated back to where they came from, houses went on the market, it created more supply, and that's what led to the decrease in values. Now, another thing that's happened since I posted that video back in 2022 is there were two other factors that I didn't give nearly enough weight to. One of those was a struggling tech sector. In 2023, the tech sector was struggling. If you remember, Facebook lost 25% of their value in one day. And so there were a lot of layoffs in the tech sector. Temporary layoffs good times. Now, a lot of those tech jobs were concentrated in a few areas like San Jose, California, San Francisco, and Seattle, Washington, places that were also COVID migration cities. 
Also, though most of the tech jobs were on the West Coast, you also had Austin, Texas, which is an outlier for the rest of Texas, but was hit pretty hard because of tech issues itself. Well, I took out the bad words and the yee-haw, but you get the gist. <laughs> Austin's tech companies make up a huge part of their economy with companies like uh, Dell Computers, AMD Processors, Salesforce, Electronic Arts, Indivia, and Adobe all being located there. As a result, between migration and tech issues, Austin, Texas saw the largest depreciation of the year at 13.6%. That was followed by Seattle with a 9.5% decrease in house value and San Francisco with an 8.9% decrease. So it was kind of the perfect storm for those areas. Tech support! The last factor that's led to some of the problems specifically with the West was really surprising to me because it seems somewhat contradictory to the first factor that was going to create some issues in the housing market, uh, the COVID migration, and that is overall migration. With COVID migration, you had people that were moving to places, creating this big demand, then ultimately moving back to where their jobs were, creating a big supply in those markets. So migration was temporary. But with overall migration, that's not been the case. The West, in general, is more expensive than the East, than the South, Southeast, etc. And you had people living there that, because affordability was getting out of hand, realized that it may just be better to move to more affordable areas. Just pick up, start over, get new jobs when they're out there. i never come back. So what you have in the South and Southeast is a lot more affordability, a lot better quality of life, and a lot of available jobs that made it a good landing spot for a lot of people to relocate. Texas has been a gold standard for that balance of cost of living, quality of life, and available jobs. So a lot of people moved here. In fact, I have clients from every single one of those Western states that's moved here, from California, Oregon, uh, Washington, Arizona, Nevada. In fact, the only two states that I don't have clients from that have been affected are Idaho and Utah, and we're only half a year in so far. You've also seen a big migration to other states in the Southeast, like Georgia, North and South Carolina, and Florida, where they have some of those same conditions. Because of that, home values have risen in those areas, with cities like Myrtle Beach experiencing a 15.4% growth year over year, Fayetteville, North Carolina at 14.7, Fort Lauderdale at 14.1, Hollywood, Florida at 12.2, Boca Raton at 12%, Augusta, Georgia at 10.3%, Clearwater at 9.8, and Lehigh Acres at 7.9. In fact, all of those cities were in the top 10 of year-over-year -year appreciation, with the only two outside of that area being Cleveland, Ohio, and St. Louis, Missouri, for some reason. Why? What on earth for? I haven't done enough research to understand it, so if you know why those cities experienced a price increase, let me know in the comments. So why is all that data important? Why is it important for me to look back at my projections from eight months ago and see where we are today? Well, partially it's because I was mostly right, and I wanted to show people like at Robert Carmichael 1973 that I am not, in fact, a snake oil salesman. Hurtful. But mostly it's because I know what a big deal it is to buy and sell a house. I know what a major decision that is, one of the biggest decisions that people can make in their life. So as a consultant, I don't want to steer people in a direction that's going to harm them for years down the road. So I don't just read the tea leaves. When I'm giving my opinion, I'm looking at all the current data. I look at all the historical data. I listen to expert opinions from people and organizations that are way higher up the real estate food chain than I am. And ultimately, I look at common rationality and perspective with all of this data to see the cause and effect of what these things are and not just see things the way I want to see them. So as a for instance, I scheduled this video to be released last week, but I waited a week because I didn't want to make any kind of projections until we heard what was going to happen with the nation raising the debt ceiling. Because if that was not resolved, it would have been a major factor for the real estate industry and the overall economy, not just in America, but in the entire world. Holy catastrophe! So back to the original question, is 2023 still a safe year to buy a house? Well, given all of this data, my answer would depend on a few things. First of all, where are you looking to buy? Where are you? Looking at this data, there are some places that are going to be sound investments. There are some places that have not only lost value, but may continue to see value loss. 
using the Zillow Home Value Index along with an expert panel that they put together. They project a 1.6% slide in 2023 nationally that will ultimately rise to about 1.7% appreciation by March of 2024. After that, they predict steady appreciation of around 3.5% yearly from 2024 to 2028, which is slower growth than in previous years, but more consistent with what we saw from like the late 80s to 2000. Even though there's a lack of supply, they look at the affordability issues, the mortgage rates, things like that that have thinned out the buyer's pool. However, if you look at the data a little bit closer, you'll see a couple of things. One, it's still going to be region specific. Zillow predicts further falling in the West with cities like Denver and Boulder, Colorado, San Francisco, and Reno and Las Vegas, Nevada continuing to see price declines. Meanwhile, the South and Southeast regions are going to continue to see migration that will lead to price appreciation. Actually appreciate it. <laughs> Zillow is predicting some of the hot spots to be places like Johnson City, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, Savannah, Georgia, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Another thing you're going to continue to see is that price point is going to make a difference in every market. With affordability issues continuing to be a factor for the foreseeable future, entry-level homes are going to be in great demand. Housing needs aren't going away. We still have an undersupply. And some of the people who maybe two years ago could have afforded a mid-level house are realizing now that if they don't want to continue to rent, they're going to have to buy what they can get, and they're going to enter the entry-level market. So that's just going to add to the buyer's pool of the most affordable housing and continue to bring those prices up. Now, this isn't anything new. As long as there's been an undersupply, there has been a need for affordable housing. Back in 2018, I made a video encouraging anyone who could to purchase any property they could find under $200,000. And the reason for that was looking at new build prices, you couldn't build a house for under $200,000 even in the farthest reaches of the greater Metroplex area where land was cheaper. So you fast forward to today and those $200,000 houses are now worth $325,000. So it's more than doubled in five years. It was a great investment. Bottom line is entry-level homes are always going to be in demand because it's got the largest buyer's pool who can actually afford to purchase. It's the main reason that with a lack of supply, the hedge funds went out in 2020 through 2022 and bought everything they could in this price point. The good news for anyone looking at that entry-level home, anywhere from right now 300, 400,000, depending on where you are in the nation, is that you don't have the hedge funds as your competition anymore. They've gotten out of the game with the interest rates going up. But what about new construction? In last year's video, I talked about how builder homes were going to be the best value in 2023. Is that still true? If you remember earlier in the video, I said that builder confidence at the end of last year was at a low they haven't seen since COVID hit in May of 2020. So they had 8.3 months of inventory, they were overloaded, and they were doing anything they could to get those houses moved. Today, in June of 2023, builder confidence has risen for five straight months and is at its highest point since June of 2022. However, if you look at the housing market index from the National Association of Home Builders, you can see that builder incentives have stayed roughly the same as they were in December as a way to continue to move inventory. Also looking at the charts, we can see that builders still have about 7.6 months of inventory, meaning it's still a buyer's market for new construction homes. Take advantage, man. Looking at all the data, I feel fairly certain that new home construction will continue to provide good opportunities for both first-time home buyers and move-up buyers. Great opportunities in places like, well, the greater Houston, Texas area. So having that been said, if you want to learn more about those opportunities in the greater Houston area, or more specifically in my hometown, the fastest growing city in America, Conroe, Texas, just pick up the phone, give me a call, send me a text or email. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have and discuss those opportunities. I'm a relocation specialist who's helped people from all over the nation, but specifically this year, places in the West, to be able to pick up and find affordability and quality of life in the Lone Star State, as long as you can handle the humidity. If you want to learn more about one of the fastest growing cities in America, Conroe, Texas, make sure to subscribe to the Conroe Living Channel or check out videos like these.